Okay, so we know that proximal tibial fractures, the tibial uh, plateau fractures are wide spectrum of injuries. They may vary from simple split fractures to complex fracture dislocations. These are inherently unstable and majority of them will require some sort of surgical treatment. Okay, so the last 10-15 years there has been a paradigm shift in how we manage these tibial fractures. There have been a lot of changes. So what we are going to see is what has changed. Uh, understanding of the fracture mechanism and injury patterns has changed. We have improved radiological assessment mainly is using a more use of CT and MR which is allowing us to assess these fractures better. Newer surgical approaches, better reduction techniques, newer implants has made fixation of these fractures that much more easier and let's have a look at each of these. The mechanism of injury when earlier we knew that it was an uh, actual load on the knee with a deforming force which was either virus or valgus because at that time our understanding of these fractures was two dimensional. We were only looking at AP x-rays and trying to decide what kind of fractures these were. With time on, we have realized that not only the virus or valgus force, but the position of the knee when these injuries occur will have a great impact on the kind of fracture patterns that you're going to see. So whether your knee is in extension or it is in flexion, there will be more involvement of the anterior half of the tibia and the posterior half of the tibia. So now why suddenly this emphasis on knowing what kind of uh, mechanism of injury we know that if we have to have a stable fixation with uh, less chance of uh, you know failure you need to neutralize the deforming forces so unless you know the direction of the deforming force you do not know where to put your place or placement of your implant may not be proper so how do we know which is the deforming force based on the x-rays that we get of the patients so to know whether there has been a predominantly a virus or valgus force, you can measure what is called the medial tibial plateau angle. We know that the normal is about 87 degrees, between 85 and 90 would be the range. So when you draw this and if you find that your medial plateau angle is increased beyond 90, it means that there has been a force which is a valgus force that is applied and your main fixation will have to be on the lateral side to counteract this force. If the medial plateau angle has reduced below normal, you know that it's been a virus force, so your main fixation will have to come onto the medial side. Similarly, if you draw or map the posterior tibial angle slope, which normally is between about 3 to 10 degrees, if there has been an increase in slope, you know that there has been an impact which is on the posterior aspect of the tibia, which means your knee has been in flexion, so you need to have a buttressing on the posterior aspect to counteract this force. If the uh, uh, tibial slope has been reduced or it has been reversed, you know that their impact has been with the knee in flexion, uh, I mean the knee in extension or maybe sometimes even in hyperextension. So your main buttressing has to be anterior. The radiological assessment has changed where we were initially depending only on plain x-rays with the AP lateral or oblique. We are now uh, having a lot better assessment with the drawback of plain x-rays was it was difficult to assess the involvement of the posterior aspect of the tibia. Secondly, if there was any other soft tissue involvement, whether it's the ligaments, whether it's the uh, menisci, is difficult to know. There are some pointers on the plain x-rays which can tell you that there may be involvement of the menisci, like if you have a joint depression more than 6 millimeters, or a widening of the tibial condyle more than 5 millimeters, especially in the lateral tibial plateau, there's a high probability that you'll have a lateral meniscal injury. But you cannot really assess the extent of that injury with plain x-rays. The game changer was when we started using CT scan more often in uh, radiological assessment of the proximal tibial fractures. With the 2D and 3D reconstructions, you can identify all the fracture lines now. You can assess where exactly where, which part of the articular surface is depressed and the extent of depression. And both of these will help us with our surgical planning. If you are planning to put an external fixator for reasons of soft tissue for these fractures, then it is a better idea if you get your CT done after the external fixator is applied so that your fracture is pulled out to length and your assessment of that fracture will be that much better.
MRI is now being increasingly used for proximal tibial fractures because literature has shown that there may be significant soft tissue injuries, whether it is meniscus, ligaments, or the chondral injuries. But should one use a MRI for every fracture, you need to individualize. The more likely injuries are to be associated with the lateral tibial fracture, so any lateral plateau fracture, I think, should have an MRI. And if there are associated injuries, they should be treated because leaving them will not give you a good result. Don't forget other modalities. Uh, many a times, a lot of these complex fracture patterns may be a relocated knee dislocation or knee fracture dislocation. And though the pulse, the pedal pulse may be well palpable, there may be intimal injuries. And the only way to document that is with a CT angio. So in such cases, make sure you've documented that. Otherwise, you get the blame if there is any accident post-op. The classification has changed. Where we were just classifying fractures based on an AP X-ray like the Schatzker or the AOOTA. It was in 2010 when the Leo came up with his three-column classification based on the axial CT scan cuts that our knowledge of these fractures improved. They were basically divided the proximal tibia into three columns, the anteromedial, the anterolateral, and the posterior. And the focus of the low classification was finding out whether there were any breaks in the cortex on any of the, these columns. And if there was a break in the cortex, it was considered as a fracture of that column. So based on how many columns were fractured, you had a one column, two column, or a three column fracture. Sometimes there may be only an articular depression without a break in the cortex. These were called as a zero column fracture, like which corresponds to the type three of your uh, Schatzker. And knowing these, the principle that Lowe was that every fr uh, column which had a break had to be reduced and fixed. And which is why that helped you with the surgical planning. A newer concept which was propagated by Cross about 2016, I think, where instead of uh, the three columns that was propagated before, he divided into 10 segments, okay? And each, the central segment, the AC and PC is where you have the uh, tibial eminences and attachment of the ACL and PCL. And both the medial and lateral tibial plateaus were further divided into four quadrants each. The whole purpose of this was to find out exactly where you had the articular depression. So the more focus on this type of classification was on finding out the articular depression. And his paper suggested that the majority of the depressions in the posterolateral central, the PLC, were ones which were most likely to be missed and very likely to be missed because you could not assess these either through an open submeniscal approach or even using the C arm and he was the one who suggested using more of arthroscopy for assessment of articular reduction. Based on our knowledge of the fractures, surgical approaches have improved. The single anterior approach in the original old days, especially if you had to do a bicondylar fracture, resulted in a lot of soft tissue stripping with high complication rate. So newer approaches have been approached. You have the anterolateral, the anteromedial, particularly have approaches for every possible column of the proximal tibia. And a single or a combination of these approaches is necessary to deal with all the fracture patterns that you may come across in your practice. And based on which approach you have chosen, you need to position your patient. The original conventional technique, we should do all in supine position because all our fixation was limited to the anterior aspect of the tibia. This gave extremely good access to the anterior columns. But if you have an associated posterior fracture of the uh, tibia, it is very difficult to assess and fix, especially the posterior lateral column. If you have posterior aspect, you can go in a prone position with posterior approaches. Excellent for uh, exposing as well as fixation of the posterior fractures, but absolutely no access to the anterior column. So if you had a combined anterior and posterior fracture, doing them with one of these approaches meant you had to do one, close up, turn the patient over and do the other side. And should there be some malalignment or a screw which was in place, then you could not do anything about that. 
So now they have come up with what is called the floating or the floppy lateral position, which is probably the position which will allow you to operate on anterior as well as posterior approach without having to redrape or rechange your position. It allows access to all four columns, and if you can uh, learn to operate with this position and have the anterolateral and the posterior medial approach, you can virtually uh, go and fix every column of the proximal tibia. Reduction techniques have improved from the older days where you had open reduction, large incisions, submeniscal arthrotomies, and visually uh, check for the reduction. We are now moving to minimally invasive techniques where only a smaller windows are made to try and reduce the articular surface. And here, because your direct visualization is limited, you have to rely mainly on the fluoroscopy to assess the reduction. And many a time they found that fluoroscopy may give you a false idea of what the reduction, especially if the articular depression is in the posterior half of the tibia. And which is why the next step came to increase your assessment of the articular surface. They now we started having arthroscopy assisted fixation. So you do the arthroscopy and under the vision of the arthroscope you can elevate your joint surface and once you are happy with that reduction go ahead and fix this. The problem with the arthroscopy sometimes is that it may not be suitable in complex fractures. There is a small risk that you may end up with a compartment syndrome because of the irrigating fluid that you have to use. But the big advantage is that it allows you good assessment of your articular reduction. And if there's any associated soft tissue injury, whether it be meniscus or the ligamentous injuries, you can as uh, tackle it at the same time. The next step came when they said, okay, let's not have this fluid going in through the fracture site. Again, I think it was Cross who gave us that 10 segment classification who suggested that use an arthroscope through your surgical incisions. And he termed that as a fracturoscopy. So this was a dry arthroscopy that was used to assess the fracture reduction. In their paper, they there are now papers which suggested that if you use a smaller diameter arthroscope, which is a 2.7 used for the wrist and hand, that may give you better access to the posterior aspect of the tibia than using the standard 4 millimeter arthroscope. Newer techniques for reduction have been introduced, a novel technique being the balloon tibioplasty, something that I have not seen or done. This is something that I read, where an inflative, and this was uh, taking imp inspiration from the same technique that was used for vertebroplasty, okay, where an inflatable balloon is used to elevate the depressed fracture fragments. Again, your reduction needs to be confirmed with either arthroscopy or fluoroscopy, and that the cavity that forms is filled with ceramic bone cement, and then do your fixation using the minimally invasive techniques. The advantages that they said was the hole that you need to insert the balloon is only four millimeters, so that fenestration in the tibia is small, which is useful if you have osteoporotic bones. If you're going to use bone punches to elevate the depressed fragment, you need to make a la long or larger windows, and there's no risk for any penetration into the joint. But these are expensive, still experimental, and they're not suitable if you have a complex fracture. So this is certainly suitable only if you have a limited uh, joint depression where the surrounding cortex is intact. Newer implants have come up, now we have uh, anatomic, you know, pre-contoured implants for every possible column except the posterolateral column. These have certainly made our fixation simpler. But remember that not all fractures require these expensive implants. Many of them can be treated very well with just your ordinary non-locking implants. The newer addition have been the rim plates where for fractures which are marginal, where are very close to the articular surface, or where you have a posterior lateral corner fracture, which you want to address from an anterior incision, you can use these very narrow width plates, which are the 2.4 or 2.57 millimeters, with multiple horizontal raft screws, which can give you a good support to the articular surface. Plate placement, again, I said, is becoming important. Now that we know which direction the force is acting, your primary buttress place had to be a, has to be on the compression side of the fracture. A secondary supporting plate on the tension side may be needed if there is comminution or instability at that site. Sometimes on the medial side, you may have difficulty deciding whether to put the plate medially or posterior medially, or should you put two plates. 
the assessment of the fracture. So if you look at the fracture and see where the fracture exits, and if you see that the exit is on the medial surface, it's on the posterior surface, so you have two separate uh, apexes which are exerting on both the surface. Depending on that, you'll have to put a medial plate, a posterior medial plate, or a dual plate. Okay, so you need to know where exactly the fracture is exiting. Despite all these new uh, developments, what has not changed over the years is your goal of treatment. So in spite whether you use the old methods of open reduction or use any of these new techniques, you need to reconstruct the articular surface as anatomical as possible. You need to restore the knee axis. You have want to have a height stable tibial plateau. So if there's any shortening of the tibial plateau, that will lead to instability because of pseudo laxity of the ligaments. And you want to mobilize these patients early. What has not changed is that the soft tissues will still dictate when you should operate. So unless your soft tissues have settled down, do not go in for fixation. The post-op protocol remains the same that all these patients who have undergone this surgery have to be mobilized early to avoid arthrofibrosis and so that the cartilage nutrition can continue. You may want to protect the weight bearing for 6 to 12 weeks depending on the fracture pattern, the kind quality of the bone and patient factors. So in summary, these are challenging uh, injuries to treat. The use of CT scan has certainly improved our assessment of these fractures. We now have surgical approaches which have been tailored for that particular fracture uh, pattern. Newer reduction techniques have minimized the surgical footprint. Pre-contoured implants have given us a better fixation. But with that, all this, our goals still remain perfect articular reduction, stable fixation of the metaphysis, diaphysis, the restoration of the axis of the tibia. Thank you.